Hiya, my name is Serena and this is Serena Speaks and today I'll be speaking about chapter two of the BNF which is the cardiovascular system. Now this is quite a chunky chapter so we're going to go through it bit by bit. So first and foremost let's look at cardiac glycosides and an example of this is digoxin. Now digoxin is a high-risk medicine and other ones include lithium, theophylline and with your high-risk medicines it's best to look out what they do, what side effects are associated with them, what um, limit, what range is safe for them to be in and when in terms of toxicity what signs and symptoms a patient may present. So with digoxin First and foremost, what does it do? Well, it increases the force of myocardial contraction and reduces conductivity at the AV node. So this can be used in heart failure. It can also um, improve um, exercise tolerance, reduce hospital ad admissions and reduce acute exacerbation episodes. Now, digoxin is usually given once a day. However, if a patient is experiencing side effects, it can be given one twice a day. Um, a limit, if the toxicity um, can increase through the ranges of 1.5 to 3 micrograms per litre. And one of the key um, points with digoxin is that there is a risk of hypokalemia. So ways that this can be overcome are, for example, taking potassium sparring diuretics, by taking potassium supplements, and even taking foods that contain high amounts of potassium in them, for example, bananas. Now, in terms of toxicity, some of the um, side effects um, or signs and symptoms that a patient who is subjected to toxicity with digoxin may present are nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, yellow vision, um, weight loss, anorexia. And I can imagine in an extended matching style question, they could have a list of um, potentially of, of high risk medicines and then they could have a statement listing the different side effects and then you'll need to match up which of those side effects are associated with which of those high risk medicines. Um, and if a person needs to have their plasma concentration level tested with their on digoxin then that's usually taken six hours after ingestion of the dose. Um, another important point to remember is that in terms of management of atrial fibrillation, the maintenance dose of digoxin is usually determined by the ventricular rate at rest, and this should not fall below 60 beats per minute. And it's usually a patient's renal function which determines what dosing of digoxin that they will be on. And in terms of liquids and tablets, they don't have the same bioavailability. So if a patient needs to be switched from a liquid to tablet or vice versa, they won't be put on the same dose. And back again with the toxicity, um, if a patient does have digoxin toxicity, then they're usually treated with a digoxin specific antibody fragment, otherwise known as Digifab. So that's digoxin. So now let's look at diuretics. So there's two main types of diuretics. There's your thiazides and your loop diuretics. Now your thiazides, they can be used in um, edema, cases of edema, and they can also be used in hypertension. So in the case of, for example, bendroflumothiazide, at a dose of 2.5, that usually indicates that it's being used for hypertension. Any dose is higher than that is usually used in terms of edema. Um, usually that edema is due to chronic heart failure. Now you have your loop diuretics. So examples include furosemide, bimetanide, and that's used in pulmonary edema due to left ventricular failure. Now, if a patient isn't getting um, relief from using one of them, then they can be used in combination together. Um, and this is usually in the case of patients that have resistant edema. In terms of elderly patients, usually they should be given low doses because they are more susceptible to side effects and they shouldn't really be used on a long term basis um, to treat simple gravitational edema, which could be treated by methods such as increasing movement, raising the legs or even using compression stockings. Now with thiazide and loop diuretics, there is a risk of hypokalemia and this can be overcome by using something like a potassium sparring diuretic. Now, preferably, they should be prescribed separately. However, if compliance is a problem for the patient, then they can be used in a combination therapy, for example, in the form of coamilifruz or coamilazide. So I want you to imagine the kidney and specifically the loop of Henle. 
So you have your proximal convoluted tubule, you have your loop of Henle, you then have the distal convoluted tubule, and you have your collecting duct. Now, loop directics act on the loop of Henle, so that's easy to remember, loop and loop. And thiazides act on the um, distal convoluted tubule, and they inhibit sodium reabsorption. Now, thiazides are quite fast acting. They act usually within one to two hours and they last for about 12 to 24 hours. And preferably they should be given in the morning to prevent any diuresis. So having to frequently go to the toilet, particularly at night time. In terms of hypertension, which we'll focus on a bit more later on, um, the, thi the thiazide diuretics that are are preferred and for hypertension are in dapamide and chlortalidone and chlortalidone has quite a long duration of action so it's usually given on alternate days. General cautions with diuretics is that they can exacerbate conditions for example gout and diabetes and a patient that is on diuretics they need to one of the key monitoring is their electrolytes because of that risk of hypokalemia. Now, I want you to think of the different classifications of um, chronic, chronic kidney disease, um, which is in the beginning chapters of the BNF, and I think it's prescribing in renal impairment. And it goes from normal to mild, moderate, severe and established. And if a patient has moderate um, or, or moderate or severe or established um, kidney failure, then they ideally should not be given thiazides. They should be avoided as thiazides are ineffective in these cases. Now, looking at loop diuretics, we know that they act on the loop of Henle, but specifically they act on the ascending limb and they can be used for resistant hypertension. So as we mentioned before, we have furosemide and bumetanide and a side effect, particularly of furosemide, is deafness especially when it's infused too quickly um, and it exceeds four milligrams per minute, then there is that risk of deafness. And with bumetanide, it can cause myalgia, so muscle pain. They both act within one hour and they usually last for about six hours. So they can be given twice a day without affecting sleep. Moving on to potassium sparring diuretics and aldosterone antagonist. So an example of a potassium sparring diuretic is amylaride. An example of an aldosterone antagonist is spironolactone. Now, amylaride on its own is quite weak. So that's why it can be given in combination with a thiazide. And one of the key side effects of amylaride is that your urine can look blue in some lighting. Um, now, potassium sparring diuretics, if they're given with an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin II um, antagonist, there is a severe risk of hyperkalemia. So that's something to be aware of. Um, and it's good practice even when you're looking at patients' PMR, see if they're on an ACE inhibitor and if they're on a potassium sparring diuretic um, and see if they are, because then they will be at risk of hyperkalemia. Um, so it would be worth checking to see if they're experiencing any symptoms of hyperkalemia. When was the last time they had their electrolytes monitored, particularly their potassium, with their potassium levels? Now, um, that's all that I'm really going to focus on diuretics. I think that was, that's a good summary of it. Um, so now let's focus on arrhythmias. So antiarrhythmic drugs and atrial fibrillation, it's quite a chunky subject in the BNF and it does take a while to go over it and understand it fully. But in summary, a person who has atrial fibrillation, they need to be assessed for their risk of stroke and thromboembolism and potentially even thromboprophylaxis needs to be given to these patients. Now there's two main points to remember. There's ventricular rate and there's sinus rhythm. So ventricular rate, that can be controlled by, for example, verapamil or beta blockers, whereas your sinus rhythm, that can be controlled by flecainide or amiodarone. Now, in terms of antiarrhythmic drugs, they can be categorised into supraventricular arrhythmias, um, so those that act on the supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, and those that act on the ventricular arrhythmias. So, what does that all mean? So basically, in essence, those that are, act on the ventricular arrhythmias, if we imagine the heart, I know the heart doesn't look like this, but just, just, just for the purposes of this video, let's pretend that's what the heart looks like. Now, the bottom bit is where we have our ventricles, the top bit is where we have our atria.
Ventricular arrhythmias is in the name. That's that's the drugs that affect the um, that act on the ventricular arrhythmias. This is where they're acting on. Those that act on the supraventricular arrhythmias, they are the ones acting on the top of the ventricles. And those that act on the atria, they're the ones acting on the top bit of the heart. So in a summary of it, those that act on supraventricular arrhythmias are, for example, verapamil, which can be used in asthmatics, um, adenosine, and even cardiac glycosides such as digoxin. However, IV verapamil and beta blockers should not be used together because they are potentially hazardous. So those that can act on supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias include flecainide, amiodarone, beta blockers, for example, saltolol, and those that act on ventricular arrhythmias are lidocaine. So moving on to beta blockers, beta blockers can be um, can be categorised depending on different properties that they have, and some examples can overlap into different categories. So, for example, if you have a patient come in and they're taking a beta blocker, but they're really finding it hard um, dealing with the side effect of the coldness of extremities, then you can take, then the prescriber may decide to change their beta blocker to one that is less likely to cause coldness of extremities or even bradycardia. An example of this is oxyprenolol and asbutalol. You have ones which are water soluble, they don't cross the blood brain barrier and they're less likely to cause nightmares. They are also excreted by the kidneys and examples of these are atenolol and nadolol and even saltolol. You also have those that have a long duration so they only need to be taken once a day and again um, atenolol is an example as is bisoprolol. Then you have some which are cardio selective, but not cardio specific. So for example, if you have a patient who is asthmatic or has COPD and needs a beta blocker, they would need a cardio selective one. And an example of that is atenolol, bisoprolol, um, metoprolol. An example of a non-selective beta blocker is saltolol. Then you have beta blockers which reduce um, mortality in patients who have had a myocardial infarction and they are for example atenolol and metoprolol and you also have those that reduce mortality in heart failure for example bisoprolol and carvedilol and then the beta blocker that is used in anxiety is propanolol. So it is important to remember examples of the different um, categories that beta blockers can be summarised in because a potential question could say this patient has been getting nightmares whilst on this beta blocker, what's an example of a beta blocker that they can be changed to which is less likely to cause nightmares. So then you know okay that needs to be a water soluble one so that needs to be something like a tenolol for example. So in general, um, side effects of beta blockers are coldness of extremities. But of course, now we know that there are some which are less likely to cause coldness of extremities. Um, also, sleep disturbances, that's another general side effect of beta blockers. And they can affect carbohydrate metabolism, causing hypo and hyperglycemia in patients with or without diabetes. So the way that beta blockers work is that they decrease cardiac output by altering baroreceptor reflex sensitivity and blocking peripheral adrenoceptors. Now, we did mention that beta blockers can be used to reduce mortality and heart failure. However, they are contraindicated, contraindicated in patients with uncontrolled heart failure. So the patient that has uncontrolled heart failure beta blockers are contraindicated. And I'm stressing that out because, again, it's little details like that where you could potentially stumble in an exam because they could use that little word, unstable heart failure, in a question and you glance over it and you think, okay, they have, um, they want to reduce their mortality um, rate in, and they have heart failure, I'm going to give them this medication. But actually, if they have unstable heart failure, then ideally they shouldn't be on beta blockers. And a really key counselling point for a patient that is on beta blockers is that they are not stopped abruptly and if they do want to be taken off their beta blocker then they need to get um, advice from their doctor. Now looking at hypertension and heart failure. So hypertension, 
we know is high blood pressure, and you uh, you want to target clinic um, blood pressure of below 140 over 90 for under 80 years old. Now, you can have ambulatory um, blood pressure monitoring and you can have home um, blood pressure monitoring. And the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring tends to be higher. Now you have stage one hypertension and you have stage two hypertension. Stage one hypertension is when a person has a blood pressure reading of more than 135 over 85 um, home blood pressure monitoring. If they're less than 40 years old with no other CV um, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, then they should be evaluated for any secondary causes of hypertension. So we need to look at why they do have such a high blood pressure. In terms of stage two hypertension, um, that's usually people who have a value of more than 150 over 95, and that's home um, home blood pressure monitoring. And all patients who have stage two hypertension need to be treated, regardless of their age. So in terms of knowing um, which medicine should be given to a patient, depending on if they're under 55 or over 55 and they have hypertension, I've come up with this um, little sheet, which helps me remember it. And um, I'll keep it up for a moment so you can take a screenshot of it if it helps. Hope you can see that properly. And so if we start off with um, under 55, <clears throat> firstly, a patient will be needing, um, will be given an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, an angiotensin receptor, an angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist. If that's contraindicated, then they would be given a beta blocker. But that's stage one. Now, if they still got high blood pressure, stage two would be to keep them on the ACE inhibitor ARB and add a calcium channel blocker. Now, if that's not tolerated or they're at high risk of heart failure, then a thiazide related diuretic um, would be given. And an example of that is indapamide or chlortalidone. Now, however, if they were given a beta blocker at step one, then at step two, a calcium channel blocker would be given in preference to a thiazide related diuretic. Step three would be your ACE slash ARB, your calcium channel blocker, plus your thiazide related diuretics, so you'd give all three. And at step four, you would give all of the above plus low dose of spironolactone, or you could increase um, the dose of the thiazide related diuretic if the plasma concentration was above 4.5 millimoles per litre. And if the diuretic therapy was contraindicated, then an alpha blocker or a beta blocker could be given instead. <clears throat> Now, if they're above 55 or if they're of Afro-Caribbean um, nationality, then number one would be a calcium channel blocker. And if that's not tolerated, then or they're at high risk of heart failure, then they would be given a thiazide related diuretic. At step two, they would be on the calcium channel blocker or the thiazide diuretic, related diuretic, plus an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And in patients who are Afro-Caribbean, then the ARB would be given in preference to the ACE inhibitor. Then step three and step four are the same for what it was for someone who's under 55. So at stage three, they would be given the calcium channel blocker, the ACE inhibitor slash ARB, plus the thiazide related diuretic. And at step four, they would be given the above, plus a low dose of spironolactone or increasing the dose of the thiazide related diuretic. And in terms of pregnancy, um, the, that, well, in terms of pregnant person who has hypertension, the drugs of choice would be methyl dopa or labetalol. So now other classifications of antihypertensive drugs include vasodilator antihypertensive drugs, centrally acting hypertensive drugs, um, adrenergic neuron blocking drugs, and alpha adrenoceptor blocking drugs. So um, vasodilator antihypertensive drugs have a very potent effect, hyper, very potent hypotensive effect. An example is hydralazine. Your centrally acting hypertensive uh, drugs are, for example, methyl dopa. And um, your alpha adrenoceptor blocking drugs, examples of that are prazosin, doxazosin, and the first dose um, can reduce blood pressure quite rapidly. So it needs to be introduced with caution.
So if we go into more of ACE inhibitors, so ACE inhibitors, the way that they work is that they block that angiotensin 1 being converted to angiotensin 2. So that's where the ACE inhibitors work. And they indicated in heart failure, in hypertension, and even in diabetic nephropathy. So in patients who have diabetes, they're more at risk of getting um, problems with their kidneys and the ACE inhibitors can help in preventing that. So caution um, in patients taking diuretics because they do have a hypotensive effect and a main side effect with ACE inhibitors, um, there's two, there's hyperkalemia, so high potassium levels, and the second one is a dry cough. And they, a person might get a dry cough because the way that ACE inhibitors work is that they inhibit the breakdown of bradykinin to other kinins um, and because of that then they get this persistent dry cough. And your example of your ACE inhibitors are your ILLs, so ramipril, lisinopril, enalapril. Um, and in terms of angiotensin 2 receptor antagonists, your ARPs, example of that are your TANs, so losartan, um, ibisartan, candesartan, and they don't inhibit the breakdown of bradykinin, which is why a person is less likely to get a dry cough with ARBs, and they're a good alternative to use if a patient can't take an ACE inhibitor, for example, because of the persistent dry cough. In general, treatment aims of chronic heart failure are to improve exercise tolerance, reduce incidences of exacerbation, reduce mortality, and ACE inhibitors and beta blockers can both be beneficial in patients with chronic heart failure. But remember, if it's uncontrolled heart failure, then beta blockers are a no-no. You can also get renin inhibitors, and renin inhibitors work by angiotensinogen being converted to angiotensinogen 1, that's where the renin inhibitors work. So they prevent the angiotensinogen being converted to angiotensin 1, whereas the ACE inhibitors prevent angiotensin tensin 1 being converted to angiotensin 2. And an example of a renin inhibitor is aliskarin. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but aliskarin. So in terms of um, anti-anginal drugs, the two main ones that are used are nitrates and calcium channel blockers. Now, the way that nitrates work is by a vasodilating effect. And because of this, they can be beneficial in heart failure because they will improve cardiac output. Now, I think um, nitrates are a good example of a medicine where the way it works, the mechanism of how it works relates to its side effects. Um, so, for example, nitrate side effects include flushing of the skin, headaches, postural hypotension. And it's a good note to make that it's too hard to remember an extensive list of the most common side effects, the least common side effects, the rare side effects for every single drug. But if you know the mechanism by which a drug works, then it's easier to relate um, to its side effects. And nitrates are a classic example of that. So with nitrates, um, some people who have angina will be taking sublingual um, GTN, glycerol trinitrate. So they might be taking this in the form of a tablet, a 300 microgram tablet, as a patch or as an aerosol spray. It provides rapid symptomatic relief of an angina attack um, or of angina and it can last between 20 to 30 minutes. And a key point with GTN tablets is that they expire eight weeks from opening it. Um, now, with isosorbone bone mononitrate, which can also be used, it uh, can come as modified release preparations. And with most modified release preparations of medication in general, that usually means that they should be a 12 hour gap from the first dose and the second dose. However, isosorbone bone mononitrate um, is different to that in that and it should be if the, from the first dose to the second dose, it should be an eight after eight hours that the second dose should be given. And the reason for that is that a person that's on isosorbone mononitrate, they need to maintain a nitrate free period. Then this will then help to reduce um, tolerance, decrease the risk of developing tolerance to nitrates. 
So calcium channel blockers, examples include amlodipine, philodipine, and again, the side effects associated with them are to do with the vasodilating effects, so flushing, headaches, and a lot of people who are newly prescribed um, calcium channel blockers tend to get swelling of the ankles as well. So if a patient is newly prescribed a calcium channel blocker, um, it's worth making it aware to them that these are the certain side effects that it could um, potentially get from calcium channel blockers. Other calcium channel blockers include verapamil and diltiazem. And diltiazem is one of those few medicines where a patient needs to stick to the same brand. Sudden withdrawal of calcium channel blockers can be associated with exacerbation of angina. Um, other antianginal drugs include nicarandol, evabradine, and ranolazine. Now, nicarandol, a big side effect with that is ulceration, um, and it helps prevent um, long term, it's used in the prevention and long term treatment of angina. And it should be established that driving is not affected in a person that's taking nicarandol. Evabradine lowers the heart rate and ranolazine can be used as an adjunctive therapy in patients who are inadequately controlled or intolerant of the first line antianginal drugs. Now very briefly just going to touch upon sympathomimetics. Now sympathomimetics can be affecting um, either alpha or beta adrenergic receptors and adrenaline acts on both. So it can increase heart rate and contractility, which is a beta-1 effect. It can cause peripheral vasodilation, which is a beta-2 effect, or it can cause con vasoconstriction, which is an alpha effect. You have ionotropic sympathomimetics, such as adrenaline, and you have vasoconstrictor sympathomimetics, for example, noradrenaline. So anticoagulants and protamine, um, anticoagulants work in the venous side of the circulation in preventing thrombus formation. And VTE, from the venous thromboembolism, can be characterised in two main types. You have deep vein thrombosis, DVT, and you have pulmonary embolism, PE. Now, all patients that go into a hospital are assessed for their risk of um, venous thromboembolism. And those that are at high risk are those above 60 years old, um, those that have limited mobility, patients who are obese, or patients who have a history of VTE. And it's important to look at their risk of bleeding versus their risk of um, throm venous thromboembolism. Now, um, Low molecular rate heparin can be used in general or orthopaedic surgery. Unfractionated heparin can be used in patients who have, who have renal failure. And Vondoparinux can be used in patients who have um, either hip or knee replacement surgery. And the same goes with those, um, the newer oral anticoagulants, the NOAX, which are Dabigatran, Apixaban and Rivaroxaban. They can be used in um, thromboprophylaxis following hip or knee replacement surgery. An example of mechanical prophylaxis are your anti-embolism stockings. So looking at parenteral um, anticoagulants, heparin is very fast acting, um, has rapid onset of action, and has a very short duration of action compared to low molecular weight heparins. And they're usually used in preference um, preference who are at high risk of bleeding because their effects can be terminated a lot quicker. Patients who are pregnant can take heparin because it doesn't cross the blood, uh, the, doesn't cross the placenta. However, um, low molecular weight heparin is preferred. Now, protamine is what is used to reverse the effects of heparin, for example, in the case of a hemorrhage. Example, um, examples of side effects of heparin include heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and hyperkalemia. Now, low molecular weight heparins are used in preference to unfractionated heparins in the prevention of VTE and in the treatment of DVT and PE. And examples of these are inoxaparin and tinsaparin. And they are usually used once a day as they have a long duration of action. So moving on to other oral anticoagulants, an example is warfarin, and warfarin works by antagonising the effects of vitamin K. It can be used in atrial fibrillation, and DVT, PE, and the way that the warfarin dose is determined for a patient is based on the INR. 
Now, I'll be honest, it took me a while to understand what INR was. And the best way that I remember it is I think of INR as runniness. And if you have a, if a patient has a high INR, that means that their blood is very runny. So they ha are more at risk of bleeding. Whereas if they have a low INR, their blood is less runny. So they're at le lower risk of bleeding. So it usually takes 48 to 72 hours for warfarin to have its full effect, and it should be taken at the same time every day. Now, you need to know what the target INRs are, depending on what condition the patient has. So, for example, an INR of 2.0 is usually for patients who have um, atrial fibrillation, DVT, PE. Um, an INR of 3 is usually for patients who have mechanical aortic valves. And an INR of 3.5 is for patients who have recurrent DVT or PE. Now, a patient who is starting on warfarin, they might be, the INR might be monitored daily or on alternate days. And eventually the intervals for monitoring will get longer and, and it goes usually up to every then 12 weeks. Now, the main adverse effects of um, warfarin is hemorrhage and the antidote for it is phytomanadium, which is vitamin K. Um, and warfarin should be stopped five days before elective surgery. So elective surgery is when you know you're going to, when you've pre-booked that you're going to have surgery for that day. A patient who's rushed into A&E and needs to have surgery, that's not elective surgery because they weren't planning on having surgery that particular day. So if it's elective surgery, i.e. they've pre-planned, they've pre-booked that they're having surgery that day, they need to stop taking their warfarin five days before that. Now, warfarin has a half-life of 36 hours, whereas the new oral anticoagulants, the NOACs, they have a half-life of around 12 hours. So missing of dose of a NOAC is, is, is quite, quite severe. Um, also, um, warfarin is cleared hepatically, whereas NOACs are cleared renally. So all NOACs are contraindicated in a patient with renal impairment. And in terms of stroke assessment and bleeding risk, Stroke assessment, stroke risk assessment is um, identified using the CHADS VASC score, and you look at a person risk of bleeding using their HASBLED score. Another point to remember is that the risk of bleeding with aspirin and warfarin is less than that with clopidogrel and warfarin. So moving on to antiplatelet drugs, um, examples include aspirin, clopidogrel and diporidomol. So aspirin 75 milligrams once a day is usually given long term to a patient, usually for life if they have um, cardiovascular de disease. Um, and a note to make with diporidomol is that it can come as a modified release preparation and it expires six weeks after opening it. Now, if a person has a transient ischemic attack, then initially what they need to be given is alteplase, um, especially 4.5 hours. Um, it should be administered 4.5 hours when symptoms um, are first present. They will then be given aspirin 300 milligrams um, once a day for 14 days. And if that, and then they'll be given clopidogrel long term. However, in the case of a heart attack, for example, um, a person who first has symptoms, onset symptoms of a heart attack, they should be given aspirin 300 milligrams straight away. If that's not tolerated, then they can be given clopidogrel 75 milligrams. The BNF also looks at um, the long term management treatments for a patient who has had a heart attack, whether that be STEMI versus NSTEMI and, and the management of stable angina. I think the BNF covers it quite well and in detail for those segments, so I'm not really going to touch upon them, especially because that for STEMI and NSTEMI is quite similar as well and quite self-explanatory. So I'm going to briefly touch upon antifibrillinitic drugs. So an example is tranexamic acid, and that works by inhibiting fibrinolysis. And anything with the word olysis at the end means to break down. So it is used to prevent bleeding, for example, in surgery, dental extraction or in menorrhagia. Moving on to lipid regulating drugs, so our statins. And statins should definitely be considered for people who are over 40 with diabetes. Now, we know we've got simvastatin, um, pravastatin. Pravastatin should be avoided in pregnancy um, and even in um, those that are breastfeeding. Now, a pet, a pet hate of mine is when I see a script for a list of medication um, 
a prescription for a list of medication and I can see that a patient takes them in the morning and then their atorvastatin, it says take one at night. And the reason that annoys me is because atorvastatin and rosuvastatin do not need to be taken at night time. Other cholesterol medication do because cholesterol levels are highest at night and that's how they work best. However, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin have a longer duration of action and therefore they can also be taken in the morning. And I think if you can take your medicines in the morning, especially if all your other medicines are being taken in the morning and then you've just got atorvastatin to remember to take at night time, so long as obviously there's no other interactions or contraindications and that it's safe to take in the morning, then they should just take it in the morning. It will increase their compliance. They won't have to remember about taking it on later on. They can just take it all in the morning and, you know, remember it, be done with it. And sorry, that's just my that's just my little pet hate. But yes, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, they can be taken so long as they're taken at the same time every day, they don't necessarily need to be taken at night time. Whereas something like simvastatin, that does need to be taken at night time. So the way that they work is they competitively inhibit the HMG CoA reductase. And um, the main side effect that people experience with statins is myalgia, so muscle pain, and even altered liver function tests. So if a patient is, um, if you want to monitor their side effects, for example, they're getting um, all this muscle ache, muscle pain, then you want to measure their creatinine kinase. Whereas um, if you're just measuring their statins in general, just to see how they're getting on, what their liver function test um, is saying, how it's having an effect on their liver, then you would need to measure their alanine transaminase, their ALT. So for monitoring side effects, creatinine kinase, if you're just monitoring statin therapy in general, then it's alanine transaminase. And the main counselling point for statins is for a patient to report any unexplained um, muscle ache, muscle pain. And a ZMB, a ZTMB can be used in conjunction with a statin if that statin therapy is um, is failing or if a statin is unsuitable. And it works by inhibiting intestinal absorption of cholesterol. So that's the cardiovascular system. It is quite a lot to take in, but if you take each section at a time, bit by bit, it'll make it a lot easier to absorb and understand. Um, I hope this video has helped. I hope this video will at least provide a foundation for you to build your knowledge upon. Um, and if you liked it, then please give it a thumbs up, give it a like, please subscribe, please share, please visit our Facebook page. And I will be releasing new videos every Thursday um, and hopefully you're enjoying them. So until next time, happy revisings.